Aloha everyone, this is Tiari here. In this video, I'll be sharing the story of Native American Annie Mae Pitu Aquash. I'll be sharing it in sections. This will be a very lengthy video and I hope that you folks will watch to the very end as it is a very important story in history about a young woman who was murdered. So this video will have seven sections. And the first is the introduction, which is what I'm talking about now of this video. And second will be the biography of Annie Mae Pitu Aquash of her life and her death. The third section will be a Facebook post written by her daughter, Debbie Malone Pitu. Fourth, I will share a time lapse of my Procreate drawing I did of Annie Mae along with the last known audio of Annie Mae a couple days before she disappeared and was executed. Five, I'll give my thoughts about the drawing and why I drew it the way I did and share another drawing I did of Annie Mae in pencil. And six, I'll share how I came to know of Annie Mae's story and how the connection on my own personal testimony of why I am feel so deeply drawn to Annie Mae. And last, I will have education and awareness of Annie Mae and also about all the missing women, children in Canada and America and about the case. Please, I hope you folks will stay to the very end. This is the story of Annie Mae, Pitu Aquash, other known as Anna Mae. Her Megama name was Naguset Yash. In Megama, it meant sun woman. And she was born on March 27, 1945. She was from the Sipaganaki First Nations at Indian Brook Reserve. From Shubanakri, Nova Scotia, Canada. Her father's name was Francis Thomas Levy. And her mother's name was Mary Ellen Pitu. She had a younger brother named Francis. And two older sisters named Mary and Becky Pictou. Because of poverty on the reservation, she only learned early education and she suffered from tuberculosis at age eight. At the age of 17 in 1962, Annie May and another Mi'kmaq tribe member named James Maloney moved together from the reserve to Boston, Massachusetts. They had two children, two daughters, one was named Denise, which was born in 1964, and Debbie, which was born in 1965. They married a year later, but then divorced in the mid-70s, after Annie found out that James was having an affair. Annie May married Nogishek Akwash, who was an Ojibwa activist. After they separated, she kept his last name. While in Boston in the 60s, she joined other First Nations of Canada and indigenous Americans, which focused on resistance and education. Her other focus was on police brutality against urban indigenous people. She was a member of AIM, American Indian Movement, which participated in several occupations, including the 1973 Wounded Knee Incident at Pine Ridge Indian Reservations in the United States. In 1974, she worked for the Red Schoolhouse Project which was based mostly in Minneapolis for Native American students who lived in the city. She then worked on Pine Ridge Indian Reservation with the elders and the Lakota people. In January 1975, at Gresham, Wisconsin, Annie May worked with the Menomini Warriors Society in a month-long armed occupation of the Lexan Brothers. The Catholic Abbey had closed and abandoned, and the Menomini wanted the property to be returned to the tribe. Later that year, Annie May was arrested twice on federal weapons-related charges, but then quickly released. Her second release was shortly before she was assassinated by AIM members. After her release from jail, AIM members grew suspicious, and they created a disinformation campaign that Aquash might be a government informant. They became nervous, and they had discovered in late 1974 that Douglas Durham, a prominent member who was then appointed as head of security for AIM, was an FBI informant. By spring of 1975, Annie May was recognized and respected as an organizer in her own right and taken an increasingly role in the decision-making of AIM policies and programs. She became close with AIM leaders such as Leonard Peltier and Dennis Banks. 
Annie May and Dennis Banks developed an intimate relationship in the summer of 1974, although he had a common marriage with another woman. In October of 1975, Dennis Banks went into hiding, and Annie May and Darlene Nichols joined him, along with Leonard Peltier and others, as they traveled through the West hiding out. While camping, Leonard Peltier bragged to Annie May and others that he killed two FBI agents in June 26, 1975. On November 14, 1975, while heading to Oregon, the state trooper pulled over the RV filled with A members. In the RV was full of guns and explosives. Peltier and Banks escaped while Annie May and others were taken to jail. On November 24th, in Pierre, South Dakota, Annie May spent 10 days in jail and released on bail. A couple days later, she went to stay in the home of Troy Lynn Yellowwood Williams in Denver, Colorado. After her time in Denver, she was last seen in Rapid City, South Dakota on December 11th, where she disappeared in mid-December 1975. On February 24, 1976, a rancher by the name of Roger Amiot found Aquash's body on the side of the State Road 73 in the northeast corner of the reservation, about 10 miles from Wanbley, South Dakota. Her remains were revealed when the snow melted in February. An autopsy was conducted by a medical practitioner named W. O. Brown, who wrote it appeared that she had been dead for about 10 days and had died from frost. He failed to notice the bullet wound at the base of her skull, and she had died from exposure, which Brown concluded. Under FBI, according to the spirit of Crazy Horse, Aquash's hands were cut off and sent for fingerprinting to FBI headquarters in Washington, D.C. Annie Mae was not officially identified at the time, so she was considered a Jane Doe in South Dakota and buried there. After eight days after her burial on March 10, 1976, Aquash's remains were exhumed due to the request from AIM members and her family. AIM arranged for a second autopsy to be conducted by Dr. Gary Peterson, a pathologist from Minneapolis. He found that she had been shot by a 32 caliber bullet on the left side of her back of her head, under her hairline, in a shot that traveled upwards, missing the brain and lodging in her left eye socket. It was described as execution-style murder. Rumors spread that Annie May was killed because A members thought she was an informant. Related to the federal prosecution of Leonard Peltier in 1975 shooting deaths of FBI agents at Pine Ridge. An investigation was started by the Bureau of Indian Affairs for Annie May's murder, as the death appeared to be taking place on the reservation. They learned that in December of 1975, that she was last seen on Pine Ridge Reservation before her disappearance. Throughout the years, many people have come forward to share what had happened to Annie Mae. And finally, a case was established and a trial began on what had happened to Annie Mae. Because of Annie Mae's knowledge of Leonard Peltier's killing of two FBI agents, it was said that Leonard Peltier gave orders to execute Annie Mae. They were assigned to kill her because she knew too much. So he had A members Arlo Looking Cloud, John Graham, and Theta Nelson Clark, who transported Annie Mae to Rapid City and they tortured and killed Annie Mae. Prosecutors focus on three people Arlo Looking Cloud, John Graham, and Thelma Rios. On February 8, 2004, a trial began for Arlo Looking Cloud and he was later found guilty of murder. In September of 2009, a trial began. Rios admitted in court that she relayed a message from AIM leadership to another member from AIM to bring a quash to Denver to Rapid City in December of 1975 because she thought she was a government informant. On February 9, 2011, Thelma Rails died from lung cancer. And in December 10th, 2010, after two days of deliberation, jurors found Graham guilty of felony murder convicted carried on mandatory sentence of life to prison.
I'm going to be reading a post that was on Facebook on October 3rd, 2013. It was on a Facebook page called Justice for Annie Mae Pictou Aquash, Woman Warrior. This is written by her daughter, Denise. She writes this, To whom it may concern, my name is Denise Maloney Pictou, and I am the daughter of murdered AIM member Annie Mae Pictou Aquash. It has been brought to my attention that there is an unofficial tribunal being conducted by the supporters and legal counsel of Leonard Peltier during the next 24 hours. In the last nine years, four trials were conducted regarding the murder of Annie Mae Pictou Aquash, with the evidence and testimony of 23 witnesses, many of them AIM and ex-AIM members. The four trials resulted in two convictions, one guilty plea and one acquittal, exposing and proving that AIM members acting on AIM leadership orders, which at the time included Dennis Banks, Clyde and Vernon Belcourt, Leonard Crow Dog, John Trudell, Russell Means, Bill Means, David Hill, etc. Kidnapped and interrogated, beat, raped, and executed Annie May in 1975. It was also exposed that Leonard Peltier participated in several in interrogations of Annie Mae by shoving a gun into her mouth and accusing her of being an informant. He had prior knowledge of the plans to execute my mother and is certainly at least complicit with a conspiracy to murder and silence her. He also bragged to my mother about shooting one of the murdered agents saying he was begging for his life but I shot the mother effer. Anyway, those are not the actions of someone using self-defense. Currently, Peltier publicly supports John Graham, the man convicted of executing my mother. If his handlers and people are interested in real justice, his involvement, knowledge, and participation in her interrogations and his very public support of Annie Mae's murders need to be addressed. Also, Bruce Ellison, Madonna Gilbert, Thunderhawk, and Debbie White Plume, who are attending this tribunal, were present at another interrogation at the WKLDOC offices in 1975 where Madonna and Lorelei Decora means slapped my mother around while her hands were tied. Bruce insisted they untie her hands while they were beating her for hours before she was taken to Bill Means house where the vote was taken to execute her. This clearly biased one-sided tribunal is being conducted by those directly involved and complicit in the murder of one of their own women. They are rehashing history in attempts to hide the fact that they are all conspirators and bound to each other by the blood they have on their hands of one of their own women and the oath they took to lie about it for 37 years. Annie Mae will have full justice. Denise Maloney Pictou And may pick two? Yes. What tribe are you from? Uh, I'm from the Mi'kmaq tribe of uh, Nova Scotia, Canada. Would you describe what happened to you this past Friday morning on the Rosebud Reservation? Uh, I was uh, awakened around uh, maybe around five in the morning by someone uh, saying that they were the FBI and that I should immediately come out and uh, I was in bed and I just heard a lot of voices all around and, and then I heard someone say let's just cut it cut, cut open the tent you know and I was trying to get out of bed and over at the door before they start cutting the tent and uh, when I walked out, I saw two FBI agents standing there with uh, M16s and uh, pistols. And, uh, and then I was told to go over and stand amongst uh, a group of women that were standing in front of the, uh, the main house of the residence of Al Running. And uh, I, I didn't know what was going on even then, other than I knew that they just came in and uh, I, I don't know the correct word to use, raided or busted or just 
pillaged or you know they, they, they were just all over the place dumping things and and just tearing things apart and, <clears throat> And they, and they just had everybody all over the place, you know, with some had handcuffs and some didn't, and everybody was standing around half-dressed, and so I went and stood over there, and uh, they came over and uh, put a pair of handcuffs on me and took me into the house and searched me, and, and they, uh, they told me that I was going to be arrested and uh, that I would be deported, and... Uh, they also uh, told me that um, they were going to charge me with uh, illegal possession of explosives. Well, they didn't say explosives, they said uh, illegal possession of dynamite. And, uh, and that, that all happened within a matter of uh, 15 minutes. That all took place and uh, I just, I stood there and they, they just continued to I could hear things crashing inside the house. They were evidently moving large objects like furniture, I would imagine, refrigerators, bureaus, or chests, because I could hear things falling off, breaking, smashing, and I could hear comments coming from them inside, uh, oh, look at this, or they would laugh at something, and then they were joking to one another because one couldn't move a dresser by himself, and You'd, you'd hear somebody going over and helping them and something would smash and then they'd, it was just like a bunch of, uh, uh, I don't know, you know, just people. Uh, they, they seemed to be having an awful lot of fun, you know, they seemed to be enjoying themselves and, and they, I mean, you could look anywhere and you could see them doing the same thing to the vehicles. They were just pulling things out and dumping things and just throwing things on the ground that were useless to them as evidence and whatever they could find that they felt that they could use for evidence, they were marking it down and whatever they felt that they couldn't use, they just threw it to the side, you know, and uh, they didn't have any respect for, for the value of any of the other contents other than what they could use for evidence, I would assume that's what they were doing. And uh, while I was standing there with a the group of women waiting, I was just uh, being verbally harassed uh, by some of the agents. They were implying that they had been looking for me for, for a long time. and. But they were very pleased that they finally found me, and then they were referring to <coughs> they were referring. Uh, well, they weren't referring really. They were they were accusing me of uh, a number of things that I have not done, and uh, I, I just they were they they said so many things to me that that I know I haven't done. That I just I just stood there because I just. I just didn't know why I was being arrested or because they, they told me so many different things that I did. just didn't know. I just knew that I was being arrested. And uh, they told me that I'd be in Canada by the afternoon, that they were going to deport me and I was in this country illegally and uh, I tried explaining to them that I wasn't and they just, they just totally ignored me. They insisted that I was here uh, illegally and then during this there were two young Indians that uh, came up to the roadblock because they had a roadblock uh, just past the Al Redding residence on the, on the main road. They had a roadblock and uh, we heard some loud shouting, yelling, and uh, the, the uh, other two women that were standing there with me, we were talking amongst each other and uh, we wanted, you know, we were saying, well, what's going on? They're yelling at someone over there, and then we heard, you know, if, if you keep going, you're not, we're going to shoot you, you know, and the other woman that was standing there, you know, she got pretty nervous because she said, you know, that somebody's going to get shot, and if that ever happens, you know, everybody's going to start shooting, and then it's going to be called an accidental shooting, and she was really scared, and uh, it turned out that, that there were two, <clears throat> there were two Indians, uh, I could see them walking into the driveway and they were handcuffed and uh, the, the agents were trying to stop them from coming in and, uh, but they walked in and then they, they were met by about four or five agents and that turned them around and started pushing them and, 
And uh, we were just standing there. I, I couldn't even uh, watch any longer because I was being distracted on the other side by all the smashing that was going on in the house and the, the uh, ransacking of the vehicles and just looking into everything that was outside, you know, uh, food containers and even looking through a little place that was secluded on the side for, for one of the female dogs that had a litter of puppies and they were even going through that and then they were just every place you know they're just picking up things and uh, finally I, I heard the helicopters going around up in the air and I could hear all the radio messages going back and forth and they and the agents are coming over, just asking questions over and over and over again. And they finally put me in the car and they put a different agent in there with me and gave him a pencil and a piece of paper. And he started asking me the same questions they had already asked me. And then he'd add on more questions. And they finally, I guess, understood that I just didn't want to talk to them. So they... They uh, put a woman agent in the back seat of the car with me, and <clears throat> we drove out towards the uh, the driveway. And uh, they they uh, they were taking me to pier, and uh, but on our way <clears throat> from uh, the running residence, we had to pass Crow Dog's residence. And uh, so therefore the agent that was driving the car pulled into the Kodog residence and uh, when I drove in there, you know, there were agents all over the place there. They had people standing up against objects and they had women and children <coughs> outside all standing around in groups, you know, partially dressed and, and, and then they they pulled, uh, the agent got out and spoke to the other agents and then he got back in the car and then they drove off and then when we passed the other roadblock, which is on, which was on the other side of um, Kodak's residence before they crossed the, the Little White River Bridge, they had another roadblock there and then we stopped there and then the agent told the agents that were there that he was taking me into pier and then they just peered into the window and then they they made comments uh, towards my name, uh, making it appear as though they all knew me by name, and they were remarking that I was a bit surly today, and uh, they drove off, and uh, we, they drove me all the way to Pier, and uh, when I got to Pier, they took me to the federal building, took me upstairs on the third floor, and they put me into of the one of the small offices and you know, I don't know how long I was in there, so 40, 45 minutes and the uh, agents were coming in and out and the two radios were going off and on. People were, there was a woman typing away and there was a radio going and every once in a while they'd come in and they'd ask me something and then finally they had one agent, one agent came in and he sat down and he showed me his card and told me his name and he started asking me questions uh, totally unrelated to <clears throat> what I was being arrested for and I told him that uh, I wanted to talk to someone, I wanted to call someone so that they can send somebody up here to help me out and, and uh, he told me that uh, I could not make my telephone call unless I talked to him first and I told him that, uh, you know, they can't do that and he said, well, you know, you're not, you're not going to get a call through unless you talk to us first. And uh, he <clears throat> he said that he was talking to me about another situation which had absolutely nothing to do with why I was being arrested. And uh, he started referring to the uh, June 26th uh, incident that happened in Ogala where three people were killed and uh, first he said that I'm talking, I want to talk to you about an incident that happened and in uh, overall on June 26th where two people, two men were killed and I told him uh, you know, there were three and uh, so he said okay three and he was a bit unnerved about my referring to the fact that there were three rather than two as he had told me and uh, he started referring to other things that uh, 
you know, had absolutely nothing to do with me. And uh, he kept insisting that I used to live there where the incident took place. And I kept insisting back to him that I had never lived there. And, and he just wouldn't believe me. And he just kept asking me questions like whether I if I knew Harry Jumping Bull or Cecilia Jumping Bull, you know, and I have never had, you know, the opportunity of even meeting these people, let alone knowing them. And uh, he just finally, I just, I just refused to talk, and uh, so he left me alone. But he, they would periodically come through and ask me something, and then finally, after I was there about three hours, and uh, they finally took me over to the county jail and pier, and. Uh, while we were driving over there, the, the uh, agent uh, kept reminding me, well, he kept asking me uh, if I knew what I was being charged with, and uh, I was just using the memory of what they told me that morning, which was, I'm, yes, I, I know what I'm being charged with, I'm being charged with illegal possession of dynamite, and he said, yes. And do you understand what that means? I said, yes. And uh, if he wanted to know if I wanted to talk to him, I said, no, I don't. He finally got me to the uh, county jail and uh, he told the, uh, the jailkeeper that uh, he had to call the uh, federal building and uh, so he did and he returned and then he had it written on a piece of paper what I was being charged with and which was different and uh, he said, do you know what you're being charged with? He asked me that again and I said, yes, the illegal position of dynamite and he says, well, this is your charge. And uh, then he showed it to me written on a piece of paper, altered firearm, uh, I mean, uh, possession of a firearm with altered serial number, which was totally different than, you know, what they told me I was being arrested for. And then he asked me if I understood that, and I said, yes, I understand it. Uh, but, well, no, I told him I didn't at first, and he explained it to me, and I said, well, then, yes, I understand. And uh, he just kept standing there asking me if there was anything more. And I just said, no. And he said, are you sure that there's nothing more? And I said, I'm, I'm sure. And he said, you, you don't want to say anything else to me? And I said, no. And he said, you don't want to talk to me? And I said, no. And the jailkeeper said, well, is that it? And he said, yes, I think so. And he'd look at me and he'd say, is this not, is not it? And I just kept insisting, yes. And I didn't want to talk to him. And so they finally uh, took me up to my cell upstairs. And uh, I would say within, within an hour, uh, I heard someone opening the door and it was uh, a woman came in and uh, she called my name so I got up out of bed and went over there and she introduced me to a U.S. Marshal and he told me who he was, he gave me his name and he gave me a piece of paper so I looked at it and it was a subpoena. I was being subpoenaed to the grand jury in Rapid City and it uh, had on there the date and the time that I, I should go there and then he left and uh, so I went back in my cell and uh, I just stayed there until later on that afternoon. Uh, they took me down to the federal building again and to my surprise that's when I found out that there were six other people in the same jail with me because I, I didn't know that. They, they I was the first one that they took away that morning and I, I didn't know they took anybody else or who else were arrested. And, and they took me out of the jail to take me over to the federal building that afternoon. That's when I saw the rest of them. They were all chained up at the waist and handcuffs, and they were chained together in these green, uh, I don't know, coveralls, I guess. And they were all put in a car, and they were going to the federal building, too. And we got there, and uh, since I don't understand any of the uh, very many uh, legal terms or a legal language. Uh, you know, I asked what I was been taking there for, and you know, I still don't remember what they told me. You know, because I've never gone through anything like that before. You know, I've never been arrested like that, and I just didn't know what, what was going on. And they they took me down to the uh, federal building, and I went in front of uh, the magistrate, and uh, there was an attorney there for me, and. Uh, I don't know, they were just talking about, oh, they said bail for me, that's right, and they, they said it at 5,000. And uh, they took me back to the jail, and then the following day I went up for um, a bail reduction, which was at first denied, and uh, with the comment that uh, my lawyer uh, was telling the uh, magistrate that 
$25,000 is, is an unreasonable figure for me because I, I, there's no way that I can get up that much money. It's, it's just totally impossible. I have absolutely no resources whatsoever. And he said, well, that's, that's right. And the, my lawyer you know, told the magistrate that I would have to you know, just sit in jail. And uh, the magistrate's reply was, yes, that's right. You know, that's exactly what you have to do, is sit in jail. And finally, they continued talking about uh, whether or not I was um, actually guilty of the charge. And I think they realized then that that was not a place to be discussing that. But, you know, a courtroom is, is where something like that has to be discussed and proved. And uh, finally, um, uh, they asked me for my own personal statement uh, as to my past uh, work here in South Dakota and I told the magistrate uh, the work that I have been doing in Oglala and uh, he still denied it, <laughs> my bail reduction. But finally, uh, he, after he was told uh, because he did make a he did make a statement stating that I had been um, indicted, and my lawyer said no, she has not been indicted. And, and to his he was, he was really surprised. He said, so, "Oh, you haven't been." And then he looked at uh, I don't know if it's a prosecutor, I think is what you call him, and uh, but I know he's not on my side. And, uh, and he asked him, he said, uh, "She's not been indicted." And he said, "Oh no." And uh, evidently that totally made a different. Uh, you know, circumstance for him to to make a decision because he uh, then said, well, one of the conditions that we can release her on would be under the custody of her lawyer, which would be, uh, you know, 10% of her bond and certainly made, made me feel happy because I knew I'd never be able to raise 5000 sitting in jail. And uh, so from there, I just, it was just a matter of waiting until people finally got together $500 and I was released on bond. And now I'm uh, working uh, myself trying to raise bail money for the rest of them, which is $5,000 each. And then I know that it's money that they cannot raise because not one of these people, you know, has uh, $5. You know, I can honestly say that, that they don't have even $5, let alone $5,000. And my whole purpose now is to, is to raise funds and also um, raise, uh, uh, or to, to have the press concentrate on, on, uh, on this whole incident because uh, to the best of of my findings lately since I've been out is that this incident uh, started uh, way before Friday morning when the raid was conducted. I hear that there have been a lot of things that have been taking place in Rosebud that led up to this and uh, also uh, we are not allowed to have um, outside uh, attorneys uh, out of the state of South Dakota. And yesterday before I was released, uh, the magistrate appointed a, a South Dakota lawyer for me whom I don't know, and uh, who knows absolutely nothing about the raid, why the raid happened, or, or he only knows what I have been charged with, and that, and that is it. And uh, I do have some people that have been willing to help and uh, for counsel, and uh, I, I don't know how that's going to turn out, but hopefully I can get some press coverage, you know, that will reach across the country and help financially and, and support physically and uh, because uh, it's very critical that these people and myself so that we get a fair, fair trial and uh, because it, it's uh, something that has been involved here for, for a long period of time. It just didn't start Friday. You know, it's something that has the injustices that have been going on on the reservations here in South Dakota. Uh, I have been just continuing and, and the only way I feel that they think they can stop them is to arrest everyone, throw them in jail, and they feel that that's the end of the problem. And I, I don't think that's, that, that's no solution to any problem. Jails are not a solution to problems, and so that's what I'm doing now. What was the FBI's excuse for coming to the running home? They gave me absolutely no excuse. As far as 
I know um, after uh, consulting with uh, my lawyer, I then found out that they had search warrants and uh, the search warrants were, um, they were looking for a particular number of things which I don't remember, but uh, they also had uh, warrants for the arrest of five of the people because of a, because of a, a supposedly uh, an assault uh, and battery uh, charge that has been signed, a complaint that has been signed by two people who are non-Indians. Did the FBI make any racist or insulting remarks to you? Uh, the, the FBI most certainly uh, conducted themselves in, uh, with the, the attitude that they are uh, a racist. Uh, they, uh, they, uh, during their search, they, they emptied uh, medicine bags and threw about medicine pipes and confiscated eagle feathers and um, varieties of beadwork and those objects that are used in sacred ceremonies they just uh, dumped and allowed to just uh, fall off of objects and they just didn't seem to care they they uh, they seemed to feel that uh, or they 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 showed that they had absolutely uh, no respect for these objects. Uh, I myself, for, <coughs> for one, when uh, <coughs> they were trying to remove my medicine bag in the uh, jail, uh, I refused to remove it and they, they told me that uh, uh, I can take it off, I, it, the boogeyman isn't going to bother me. And uh, that's it's, uh, it's an insult. and. They don't have the ability to <clears throat> to be able to comprehend that an, another people has another belief other than what uh, they have been uh, believing or practicing, whatever it may be. They they seem to to feel that if you don't uh, if they're not familiar with uh, what your beliefs are, and then then they use that to ridicule you, to criticize you, to make fun of you. They were making fun of a woman that was praying. They were snickering at her, and um, you know the, the the FBI don't have any respect for these articles, and you know the people are really worried because they 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 want to know why they're why they want these things, why are they confiscating these things, you know what are they what do they plan on doing with these things, and um, I think it's a very serious uh, matter. Uh, when it touches on to these objects because um, it, it definitely shows that they have absolutely no respect for a, a religion or a belief that uh, another nation has and uh, that's very discriminating, that's very racist and uh, <coughs> they don't have the, uh, the ability to, to just allow someone to believe in something else, something that's totally different something that may be even totally alien to them. The fact that uh, they don't have to understand it, they don't have to uh, uh, be a part of it, uh, but I think they should have at least the, the respect, not for, I wouldn't ask for respect from, from them, uh, but I think they should re be able to at least respect themselves, to at least have the ability to be able to allow someone the freedom of believing whatever they want to believe in. And one of the things that I have forgotten here is that uh, when I was taken into the federal building in Pierre several times, uh, each time I walked into the main corridor, the lobby downstairs, uh, it was, uh, they had these uh, Join the American Revolution flags plastered all over the walls. And to me that was such a hypocrisy. You know, they are asking this country to join in on a revolution that they feel is totally justified uh, for whatever reasons they may have had when they uh, decided to uh, pull away from whoever um, you know they feel that that's something you can celebrate and uh, that you should be proud of and uh, in turn they themselves can at the very same day uh, look upon a nation and ridicule them for 
what their beliefs are. And I, I do feel that uh, this is something very important. I, I, I have seen that there is something that is disturbing uh, the, the agents very much. They are very frustrated or angry or there is something, there is something wrong somewhere. Uh, it is not only the raid that uh, they seem to be interested in, there were a lot of other things about Indian people in general uh, that they are very, very concerned with. The, uh, the American Indian movement, they are very, very concerned with that and I think it's, uh, it's not just uh, arresting those that they went there to arrest because they included a lot of other things, the religious items that they took and the ridicules and the remarks that they gave which are totally unnecessary, I think is a very serious, is, it's coming out and it, it's very, very serious. Uh, I, I think that they most definitely want to uh, destroy a nation if it will not subdue to the living conditions of a so-called reservation and those that do not want those kinds of conditions for their their children or for themselves, then I think that uh, they definitely are out to destroy that concept of freedom. And uh, that's it. Uh. So this is the completed work I did of Annie May Pitua Quash. The style of work I did here is Boism. It is the style of light what Henry Matisse would draw as an expression of colors and it's not really depicting like photorealism. The original picture had her hands in it, but I felt like because the FBI agents cut off her hands, I did not want to include that in this drawing here. It made me feel very uncomfortable. But I wanted to depict what she could have looked like when she was found by the ranger on near the highway. I chose these colors, red, blue, black, and white. Native Americans, they felt like black was a color of death, and the white was cold like snow, also blue, and of course the red. And you notice on the left side of her face and her head, it represents the gunshot that had entered through the temple to the left eye. So I wanted to capture her face looking very scuffled up because of her beatings and her face was unrecognizable. I wanted to capture that. And so also, I also drew another drawing of Annie Mae. It was years ago. I drew her in pencil and I wanted to share this also with you. What I did of Annie Mae, and I hope you enjoyed that, and it was very haunting hearing her, her voice in the video. This is how I come to know of the story of Annie Mae Pictou Aquash. It was through her friend John Trudell. Years ago, I watched the movie Thunder Heart. John Trudell was in the movie, and I came to know his story about the American Indian movement. In the movie, it talks about Annie Mae, which I learned later in his movie, Trudell. Trudell was a movie about his life and how he was in the American Indian movement. He had lost his wife and children due to speaking against the government. In the movie, Thunderheart, the lady portrayed as Maggie, Eagle Bear, was depicting Annie Mae. Even though the whole movie wasn't about her, it just talked about her. I knew about John Trudell and I found him on Facebook. We had corresponded through text messages before and then later on we were in communication with one another on the phone. And he would talk about his life, about wisdom, about the struggles of life and the government. Well, he. He, I would really admired and respected John Trudell. I began drawing pictures of him, and this is one of the drawings that I did of John. 
This was actually the last drawing I did before he passed away. He had cancer. And I also drew another picture of him here. When I get to know more about the story about Annie Mae, I feel like he did befriend her. The reason being is there is a dark side to John Trudell that the public eye doesn't see. And many of women I knew and others, there was things that John did that nobody knows about. And I can't discuss that, but I can see how he befriended Annie Mae. And I read an article about John Trudell that the FBI did a 1700 page document on him. And one agent said that he is extremely eloquent, therefore extremely dangerous. It made me think about that. And it made me also think about what Denise Maloney said about John Trudell. And the more I read about what she said, and the more I remember what John did to me and others, I don't want to bash him, but he pretty much groomed a lot of us women. It made me feel that what Denise was saying was true and that John had a part in Annie Mae's death. Johnny did not kill Annie Mae and he did not partake in wanting Annie Mae killed. He was her friend, but he kept his mouth shut because of what happened to his family and his role in AIM. So he kept his mouth shut and years later, he would go on to tr into trial and speak about her death, of what he knew. But that's how I know about Annie Mae. I instantly felt a connection to Annie Mae because of her lifestyle. And when I was a young kid, I used to dream about going to Canada. I also was deeply and still deeply interested in Native American culture. And her life and her story, just I gravitated to her about what happened to her and that she had two daughters, I have two daughters, and that she moved away from her two children. And the connection with John Trudell, it really moved me. I also remember dreams of, of being killed in the snow, and I was always afraid of guns. And so that's just a part of what I, why I'm so, I feel so connected with Annie Mae and her story and that her focus were on the elders and the children and the importance of keeping cultural practices alive and to speak up against injustices of their people. And she had passed away in mid-December of 1975. I was born in mid-December of 1975. So it really, the connection was really strong because of that time when she passed away. Many people do not know about the truth about what happened to Annie Mae Pictou Aquash. Many of the AIM leaders were public speakers and they did not speak the truth about their involvement with Annie Mae's death. Many people have taken it to their grave, such as Russell Means, Dennis Banks, Thelma Diaz, Clyde Belcourt, and John Trudell. While many are still in prison, like Leonard Peltier, Arlo Looking Cloud, John Graham, a new AIM movement still lives on today. Members are taking this movement as a powerful force to their culture and their community. I must let you know that there is a alarming rate of murders of women, Native women in Canada and America. They are being silenced in their communities, on their reservations, or sexually abused, kidnapped, and murdered. And so I hope this story will help you understand the indigenous people of the Americas and Annie Me Pitu Aquash's story. I hope that you folks enjoyed this video. It was really an important video to make. And all of the images and the footages that you see is all fair use for those who are wanting to know, to be educated about this story and about the American Indian movement. And while I see that groups like this 
can be a positive thing. Just know that there are negatives behind each movement and we see it in all different groups. But the government has a role in all of this as well to divide and conquer. So yeah, this is just a piece of the puzzle here. And hopefully I'll be doing more videos like this in the future. Aloha.